Thank you, Franco, for that very nice introduction. Spending these last few months here at HITS has been a real pleasure, um, and I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity. And a big thank you to everyone at HITS who made it possible. Um, it's been edifying through and through, and I've learned so many things. I've learned about mathematical earthquakes, and I've learned about uh, MOFs, which are metal organic frameworks used for targeted drug delivery. Um, and from a couple of researchers in Frauke's molecular biomechanics group who took my writing seminar. Um, I learned about collagen radicals caused by aging and mechanical stress. I also dabbled in phylogenetics versus phylodynamics in natural language processing and spurious statistical patterns, um, as well as astro seismology and superhabitable exoplanets. Today, however, my subject is one that cuts across the scientific spectrum. And it's something I've been discussing with various researchers at HITS here and there, and that is uncertainty. Um, scientific uncertainty is something that I've been researching for a while now, for a couple, couple of years. But of course, it took on an immediacy and an urgency last March when much of my reporting shifted to uh, focus on COVID-19 and the pandemic. So during my talk, I'll reflect upon that reporting, uh, some of which is ongoing. So as Frauke mentioned, I write primarily at the moment for the New York Times uh, science section as a freelance contributor. And some of my first articles about the pandemic were what's called service journalism. Uh, so trying to do a public service of sorts in sharing essential information and raising awareness. Um, and my first COVID related piece was a Q&A with, um, it's gonna get my, there we go. Uh, it was a Q&A with Drew Harris, who's a population health analyst in Philadelphia. And he was among the first people to share and unpack the flatten the curve infographic. My second piece was also a Q&A with the husband and wife team of Bill Hanaj and Helen Jenkins. They're both epidemiologists in Boston. And they had composed a version of this cut the transmission diagram with their kids on the whiteboard in their kitchen. And I did yet another Q&A. The Q&A format is a, is a good one for getting across information simply and quickly in a way that's easily digestible. This one was with Ian Mackay, a virologist in Brisbane, Australia. He created this Swiss cheese infographic, emphasizing how multiple interventions are necessary to mitigate and contain the coronavirus. Social distancing, masks, vaccination, no one intervention suffices on its own. All are necessary to have a cumulative effect in containing COVID-19. So these pieces all aimed to convey the relative certainties, some of the information we knew to be true. The bottom line being that human behavior has a big effect on the dynamic of the pandemic. But the broader picture, of course, quickly revealed itself to be one of profound uncertainty. And I first wrote about that in April with my article on embracing the uncertainties. Back then, the confirmed global cases of illness from coronavirus were approaching 1.5 million and reported deaths were well into the six figures. But a big unknown was what are the true rates of infection and mortality? This was the art for the article. And I wasn't quite sure about it at first because I didn't think it captured what I hoped would be a slightly reassuring or comforting message. Um, but now I do think it was spot on because here we are 10 months later and we're still trying to outrun some of the same uncertainties. And the toll is massive. Um, the confirmed cases worldwide now exceeds 96 million and the global reported deaths exceed 2 million. And there are ever more uncertainties, um, such as the nature of the UK variant and the various uh, variants that are emerging, um, whether they will achieve viral escape or whether the vaccines and our natural immunity uh, will be effective in protecting us. So as I said in the article, this type of uncertainty about facts and numbers and science is called epistemic uncertainty. Um, and it's caused by a lack of knowledge about the past and the present. Or as David Spiegelhalter, a statistician at the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication at Cambridge put it, it's caused essentially by our ignorance. Science of course is full of epistemic uncertainty, circling the unknowns, inching toward truth through argument and experiment is how scientific progress is made. But science is often expected or assumed to be a monolithic collection of all the right answers. As, as a result, scientists and the politicians and policymakers and journalists who depend upon them are reluctant to acknowledge the inherent uncertainties, worried that candor undermines credibility. 
We've seen this again and again through the, through the pandemic, especially in the early stages. Spiegelhalter was one of the main sources for my Embracing the Uncertainties article, since in Googling around, I came upon this timely paper addressing the effects of communicating uncertainty on public trust in facts and numbers. It was by a group of researchers at the Winton Center, together with collaborators in mathematics and social psychology departments. The question behind their study was, what happens when scientists do acknowledge uncertainty? The paper was published in late March, but it had been submitted for review in August of 2019, so the timing was purely fortuitous. The motivation for the study, as Spiegelhalter explained it, was rooted in, to quote, the accusations of a post-truth society and claims that the public had had enough of experts. This prompted the researchers to investigate whether trust in experts was lowered by their opening, openly admitting uncertainty about what they know. But to the contrary, the study's findings suggested that being transparent about uncertainty does not in fact harm the public's trust in the facts or in the source. To give you a brief snapshot of the methodology, using online surveys, the study measured reactions to uncertainty expressed in statements about various subjects, such as the number of tigers left in India, the increase in global average surface temperature between 1880 and 2010, and unemployment figures in the United Kingdom. The survey was replicated in the wild, so to speak, on the BBC News website. And the researchers tested two different ways of expressing un uncertainty quantitatively with a numerical range or percentage, and more qualitatively using a word such as estimated or approximately. And the counterintuitive result was that the more precise numerical statements were more effective, both in conveying uncertainty and in maintaining trust. And in acknowledging their own uncertainty, if you will, they um, disclosed that there was in fact a minor reduction in trust, but they deemed it to be negligible. So the conclusion as described by one of the co-authors was that people can handle the truth. And I think the caveat there would be reasonably minded people, rationally minded people, um, but people in general can handle the truth about the level of certainty or uncertainty of scientific facts and knowledge. Again, all this research and analysis had been conducted in 2018 and 2019, but starting in March of last year, the experiment was replicated in several countries in the context of the pandemic with statements about the severity of COVID-19, among other questions about trust and trustworthiness of government officials and scientists. And the results confirmed the paper's findings. This is a graph showing the level of trust in scientists in handling the pandemic, so fairly high consistently. And this is the level of trust in information from the government, lower, but not too, too bad. Could be worse, all things considered. So as Alexander Freeman, a co-author and the executive director of the Winton Center told me, where there is uncertainty around COVID-19, scientists shouldn't feel concerned about communicating this to the public. In fact, it may be important to do so. This group of researchers has been exploring uncertainty in its many forms for a while now. Freeman told me that at a conference of uncertainty specialists about two years ago, she asked attendees to write definitions of uncertainty on post-it notes and stick them on the wall. She found that there was numerous um, different definitions. It, it varied almost person to person. She, but she said her favorite was anything and everything that can muck up a decision or insert your descriptor of choice. The March study focused on people's reactions to epistemic uncertainty. So things we don't know about the past and present, but in theory could come to know through measurement. The team has since started researching perceptions of aleatory uncertainty. So unknowns about the future due to randomness, indeterminacy, chance, or luck. And most uncertainty is a mix of two, of the two. Um, for instance, how many more people by the end of the pandemic will get COVID-19? Common wisdom from a psychological perspective is that people do not like uncertainty, especially about the future. And this is called ambiguity aversion. But from a statistical perspective, the hypothesis is that people have a positive reaction and trust information more when the communicator is being open about the uncertainties. And this was borne out in the research. For a broader perspective, I consulted with Lorraine Dastin, an historian of science at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. She's someone I had consulted with on the subject of uncertainty previously, and she'd steered me in various directions. She found the study's results heartening 
And she pointed out that the public in turn must be open to considering and adapting to new evidence. She said, quote, we the public must expect scientific views on the nature of the virus and how best to combat it to change as more evidence comes in. And we must be prepared to change our conduct accordingly. So that was the scientific core of my first uh, piece of reporting on uncertainty. Uh, but I continued down the rabbit hole in that piece a bit further. I learned, for instance, that in the early days of the outbreak, when data was just beginning to emerge from China, we were in a state of deep uncertainty or radical uncertainty. So a quagmire of unknown unknowns where there simply are no constraints. Sometimes it feels like we're still stuck in a fairly deep state of uncertainty, but Spiegelhalter pointed out that the uncertainty has been significantly constrained in the interim. He defines statistical science as, quote, a machine to turn the variability that we see in the world the unpredictability, the enormous amount of scatter and randomness that we see around us into a tool that can quantify our uncertainty about facts and numbers and science. Similarly, mathematical modeling provides projections that at once show and evaluate the uncertainties. But models, as we've seen, are imperfect and have limitations. They're simplifications of the real world. And as the saying goes, the map is not the territory. This is reminiscent of a one paragraph story by the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges, written in 1946, titled On Exactitude in Science, or On Rigor in Science, depending on the translation. It's about a map growing as large as the territory it was meant to represent. And the upshot is that a map of the empire, an empire um, that is as big as the, the empire, is essentially useless. And science, without uncertainty, is not only useless, but impossible. And this is a point that came up in a conversation I had at HITS with Saskia Hecker, who leads the research group on theory and observation of stars. Hecker mentioned that when she started studying astrophysics, she was shocked to discover that sometimes there are very large uncertainties in measuring stars. The amount of uncertainty in results pertaining to the age of a star can be as much as 50%. But she went on to note that in what became her area of specialty, astroseismology, studying the internal structure of stars through their os oscillations, various tools sharpen the measurements and reduce the uncertainty. For instance, the age of a red giant, her particular area of interest, can be estimated within about 20 to 30%, maybe even 10% in good cases. So that is indeed a considerable reduction in uncertainty. Another researcher at HITS, Vincent Ouvelin, uh, leads the research group on data mining and uncertainty quantification. This line of investigation doesn't try to reduce the uncertainty, but rather accepts the uncertainty and aims to compute it in order to derive the impact in large data sets. Ouvelin explained to me that the most obvious way of understanding uncertainty is forward propagation. Given a starting point, what will happen and with what degree of uncertainty? There is also backward propagation. Given a result that shows uncertainty, what is the origin? One application is in the medical field. For instance, given cardiac surgery and a complexity of variables, what is the corridor of the result? What is the corridor of uncertainty? Since uncertainty computation is highly CPU intensive, Ouvelin works on what he calls hardware aware computing. That is increasing the accuracy of an uncertainty prediction by increasing the compute power for models, using at best the underlying hardware architecture of supercomputers. A third area of HITS research that caught my attention in this context was the computational statistics group led by Tillman Gneiting. Gneiting's area of expertise is forecasting, for instance, in environmental sciences and weather, as well as economics and finance. Last fall, a postdoc in that group, Johannes Bracher, gave a seminar about a relatively new project that he'd been coordinating called the German-Polish COVID-19 Forecast Hub. And this is a screenshot of the online platform. The goal of the Forecast Hub is basically to map or quantify the uncertainty with short-term probabilistic predictions of COVID-19 cases and deaths. Here, deaths are shown. The focus is on one and two week forecasts. The outer range is three and four week forecasts, but they are less reliable. 
And the researchers always like to emphasize the distinction between short-term forecasts, which attempt to predict what is going to be observed in the future, versus longer scenario forecasts, which make a what-if hypothesis statement about the future. For instance, how would case rates change if nursing home staff were tested twice a week compared with once a week? In this graphic representation, each color represents a model by a different modeling team, and the width of the color band indicates the range of uncertainty. More specifically, the aim of the forecast hub is to improve uncertainty predictions. So again, not to reduce uncertainty, since given the nature of the pandemic, reducing uncertainty is impossible, alas. As Gnighting explained to me, quote, it's different with weather. With weather, we use models to reduce uncertainty. It's easy to quantify because there is a clear cut baseline based on data from previous years. For example, we know it's going to snow every 20th day or every 30th day in winter on average in Heidelberg. So by using weather forecasts, we substantially reduce uncertainty. But for COVID-19, there's no baseline at all. Instead, the goal is to make the best attempt at quantifying the uncertainty. The approach is as follows. The researchers collect various forecasts done by independent teams in academia, government, and industry, and put them together in what's called an ensemble forecast. The ensemble forecast combines and compares, analyzes, and averages all the predictions. The various models give differing forecasts because they use different data sources and methodologies. And what the researchers have found is that the ensemble model tends to do a better job predicting the uncertainty. It is better than any individual forecast on average. As Bracker put it, to quote, one of the major advantages of the ensemble is that it is more stable. Individual models tend to get thrown off every now and then when something doesn't go right. The ensemble model in averaging all the results provides more stability. It is rarely the best model, but it is often among the better models and in the long run shows good average performance. The German Polish forecast hub runs in close collaboration with the US COVID-19 forecast hub led by Nicholas Reich's lab at the University of Massachusetts. And whereas the German Polish hub assembles 18 models, the US hub is an aggregate of about 75 models. The key purpose of this type of uncertainty quantification and probabilistic forecasting is to allow for the best possible decision-making. So by policymakers and government and public health experts. But even ensemble forecasts are far from perfect, especially in our pandemic context. Gnighting told me that the experience has been quite sobering because this research demonstrates that even with state-of-the-art models, there is substantial uncertainty. The pandemic is simply uncharted territory. But nevertheless, he sees value in these invest investigations, even if only in simply making clear that any kind of predictions and hence policy decisions regarding the pandemic are incredibly difficult. So that's my current focus. I'm looking forward to a, a research paper that should be um, available in preprint form sometime soon. Um, and that might provide a jumping off point for an article on ensemble forecasts, which I think might further advance um, the general understanding of our chronic state of uncertainty. As Nick Reich, who leads the US Hub, put it recently in, a, in an op-ed in the Washington Post, he said, the pandemic is shaped by human behavior. So educating people about the benefits and limitations of forecasts can help us fight the pandemic. My latest public art, published article on uh, COVID-19 covered a vaccine prioritization study. The study used what's called a coupled model, modeling both human behavior and disease dynamics, thereby aiming to hone predictions and projections. It was somewhat atypical for an infectious disease study because it applied game theory, a mathematical way of modeling how people make strategic decisions in a group. And it combined that with more traditional epidemiological modeling. This was by another husband and wife team, Chris Botch at the University of Waterloo and Madhur Anand at the University of Guelph together with their PhD student, Peter Gents. And Botch said that the pandemic is a prisoner's dilemma game played out repeatedly. The prisoner's dilemma is a scenario in which players weigh cooperation against betrayal, often producing less, a less than optimal outcome for the common good. And another game theory framework that would also be relevant um, is called an assurance game or trust dilemma, which describes a conflict between safety and social cooperation. Botch said that the pandemic presents an everyday complexity of such choices. 
Imagine if everyone followed public health recommendations. They wore masks, socially distanced, washed their hands, followed state at home orders. He said, in that case, obviously there is a significant redu reduction of risk and infection. Uh, but there are always trade-offs and temptations to defect from the regimen. Masks are annoying, hand washing is tedious, you need a hug, you need some socialization. In his lectures, when talking about the use of game theory in human environment systems modeling, Botch invokes a comparison between the writer Anne Rand, who made a virtue of selfishness, and Star Trek Spock, who said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Now, the final piece I'll highlight is one that I published back in August, which ran under the headline, How to Think Like an Epidemiologist. Although my working title had been How to Think Like a Bayesian, which I think somewhat more accurately captures what the piece was getting at, because it looked at how Bayesian analysis can be used in an epi epidemiological setting, setting um, again, to hone the accuracy of predictions and projections. So this piece, although published in August, was seeded way back in March with Bill Hanaj when I spoke to him about breaking the chain of transmission. He'd made a kind of offhand remark about how given all the new information coming in daily, uh, that he was in a constant state of reminding himself to update your priors. And that phrase simply caught my attention and kind of stuck in my brain. And then I saw it mentioned here and there on Twitter and I got Googling and that sent me down the Bayesian rabbit hole. So as I state here at the outset of the piece, update your priors refers to the iterative process of updating evidence and the gradual accumulation of knowledge. This is in a sense, the heart of Bayesian analysis named after Thomas Bayes, an 18th century Presbyterian minister who did math and a number of other things on the side. And Bayes' theorem is a device for rationally updating your prior beliefs and uncertainties based on observed evidence. Now I'd say I was vaguely aware of Bayes and Bayes' theorem, um, but I definitely needed something of a Bayesian boot camp to get up to speed um, on the finer details. And for this, the statistician Joe Blitstein at Harvard proved an invaluable source. Blitstein delves into the utility of Bayesian analysis in his popular course, Statistics 110, which he's given about 15 years running with one year of sabbatical in there. And the entire course is available on YouTube. In lecture one, he says, math is the logic of certainty and statistics is the logic of uncertainty. Everyone has uncertainty. If you have 100% certainty about everything, there's something wrong with you. By the end of lecture four, he arrives at Bayes' theorem, which he says is his favorite theorem because it is mathematically simple, yet conceptually powerful. And in Blitzstein's hands, it can be proved in one line. As he likes to say, the theorem essentially reduces to a fraction. And it expresses the probability P of some event A happening given the occurrence of another event B. He observed that naively you would think, how much could you get from that? It turns out, however, to have incredibly deep consequences and to be applicable to just about every field of inquiry from genetics to political science to historical studies and beyond. As I found digging around, the Bayesian approach is used in analyzing racial disparities in policing and in search and rescue operations. The search area narrows as new data is added. Cognitive scientists ask, is the brain Bayesian? Philosophers of science posit that science as a whole is a Bayesian process, as is common sense. Bayes' theorem is also frequently used to assess the accuracy of diagnostic tests factoring in the sensitivity and specificity of the tests. And this is a subject that was discussed widely at the beginning of the pandemic. How accurate were the COVID tests? How likely were false positives and false negatives? And what were the implications? And if you're interested in doing a, a deep dive on this, I'd recommend Blitzstein's animated explainer titled Bayesville on YouTube, which is both charming and enlightening. The scientific core of this piece on Bayesian analysis uh, was a study exploring a somewhat novel use of Bayesian analysis in an epidemiological modeling setting by two statisticians at Stanford, Claire Donnett and Susan Holmes. Although Donnett was just finishing her PhD at the time that the study came out and she's now at the University of Chicago. Their motivation came by observing epidemiological research in March about how the pandemic might evolve they noticed that classical epidemiological models tended to use fixed parameters or constants for the reproduction number, say a reproduction number of two, the reproduction number being the average number of cases 
generated per infectious case. But in reality, of course, the reproduction number is not a constant. It depends on random uncertain factors, viral loads and susceptibility, behavior and social networks, so socioeconomic class and culture, weather, air conditioning, and many other unknowns. With the Bayesian perspective, they explained, the uncertainty is encoded into randomness. Donna and Holmes began by supposing that the reproductive number had various distributions, the priors. Then they modeled the uncertainty using a random variable that fluctuates, taking on a range of values, as small as 0.6 and as large as 3.5. In something of a nesting process, the random variable itself has parameters that fluctuate randomly. And those parameters too have random parameters known as hyperparameters, et cetera. The effects accumulate into a Bayesian hierarchy. Holmes calls it turtles all the way down. And she explained that the up and down random fluctuations multiply like compound interest. As a result, the study found that using random variables for reproductive numbers more realistically predicts the risky tail events, the rarer but more significant super spreader events. I spoke to a number of researchers about this somewhat atypical approach uh, to COVID uh, research and epidemiological research to get a survey of, of whether they thought it, it held value. And they agreed that it did. Natalie Dean, who's a professor of biostatistics at the University of Florida, said that we should be less focused on finding the single truth and more focused on establishing a reasonable range, recognizing that the true value may vary across populations. Bayesian analysis allows us to include this variability in a clear way and then propagate this uncertainty through the model. Now humans on their own, however, without a Bayesian model for a compass are notoriously bad at fathoming individual risk, but it is a perspective that one can cultivate. For Mark Lipsitch, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Harvard, Bayesian reasoning comes awfully close, close to what he calls his working definition of rationality. And he said, we should be less focused on finding the single, oops, sorry. Uh, he said, as we can learn more, our beliefs should change. One extreme is to decide what you think and, and be impervious to new information. Another extreme is to overprivilege the last thing you learned. In rough terms, Bayesian reasoning is a principled way to integrate what you previously thought with what you have learned and come to a conclusion that incorporates them both, giving them appropriate weights. But even with evidence, revising beliefs isn't easy, not even for scientists and experts. We've seen this with the World Health Organization, with its advice on masks, for instance. When we don't update, that's when problems arise. Returning to the trustee Spiegel halter, he said that you can interpret confirmation bias and so many ways in which we react poorly by being too slow to revise our beliefs. But he also noted optimistically that various techniques compensate for Bayesian shortcomings. He is particularly fond of a general approach called Cromwell's law. And I'll give Spiegelhalter the last word and end with a paraphrasing of his, his telling of Cromwell's law. It goes like this. In 1650, Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, wrote in a letter to the Church of Scotland, quote, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. In the Bayesian world, Spiegelhalter said, Cromwell's, Cromwell's law means you should always keep a bit back, a tiny little bit of probability for the fact that you may be wrong. Then if new evidence comes along that totally contradicts your main prior belief, you can quickly ditch that and lurch over to the, whatever new way of thinking seems to fit better. In other words, Spiegelhalter said, keep an open mind. That's a very powerful idea. And it doesn't necessarily have to be done technically or formally. It can just be in the back of your mind as an idea. Call it modeling humility. You may be wrong. And with that, I will end and open the floor to questions. Thank you.